Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's final session of the Different Strokes Conference 2022. Um, today, we're going to have a, a panel of experts to um, field some of the questions that we have uh, sent in, in, people have sent in in advance. But before we do that, um, my name is Ranj Palmer, so I'm the chair of Different Strokes. Um, and I had my I had a stroke um, some years ago, back in 2009. And since then, uh, I've been involved with different strokes in um, various capacities, um, initially as a um, person who started or wanted to start a group. And so uh, I co-run a group down in Southampton in the UK um, and then became a, a trustee and then chair of the charity. Um, I'd like to start off with a, um, a few um, housekeeping type rules. Um, so I'd like to thank our sponsors, Bolt, Burden, Kemp, without whom this event would be would be able would not be able to be put on. Um, I'd like to mention that the call is being recorded, but the only people that will appear on screen are the panelists, and that no details are being captured or recorded of anyone who is viewing the webinar. Um, if you look to the bottom of your screens, there is a chat function. Um, and we encourage people to use that chat function, maybe tell us where you're kind of dialing in from or something. Um, and it's in a, it's really for people to kind of make general comments about what, what's being said today. And if there's any hints or tips or anything like that, then please feel free to put them in there. Um, there's also a Q&A function, and this is specifically for exactly that. It's for questions to be posed to the panel, and that's going to be fielded during the discussion today. Um, if there are any questions that we don't get to, please feel free to contact us on the info at differentstrokes.co.uk email address and we'll do our best to get replies sent to you guys. Um, okay, so let's start off with some introductions. If I can go around the room, I'll start with Melanie. If you could uh, unmute yourself and introduce yourself, tell us a bit about you. Thank you, Raj. Um, so hello, I'm, I'm Melanie Derbyshire. Some of you may know me from my work with Speakability and the Stroke Association. I'm an aphasia and empowerment specialist, uh, currently moonlighting as chief executive of the grant making charity Independence at Home. And I'm delighted to be here today. Thank you, Melanie. Um, if I can move on to Claire now, if you can do the same. Good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, really nice to be here and see so many names coming up on the screen from all over the country. So um, this is Different Strokes is a group I've been involved in for a number of years. So I'm a physiotherapist based in Northampton working for Physio Function. And some of some of uh, the viewers today on the on the call might recognize uh, physio function because uh, some of our therapists provided exercise videos and done quite a lot of um, work with different strokes, especially during sort of lockdown time, which is something we we've really enjoyed doing. Um, so, yeah, thank you for inviting me along. I always in, enjoy this afternoon. So um, I look forward to sort of participating in the questions. Thank you, Claire. And last but not least, Giles. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Giles Yates. I'm a consultant clinical neuropsychologist and couples therapist. I'm also an academic researcher at Oxford Brookes University, and we're trying to always find new ways to provide emotional and social support to stroke survivors and uh, those significant to them. I'm also a Tai Chi instructor, and some of you may have seen my Tai Chi uh, and Qigong for stroke videos on the different strokes channels. Nice to be here today. Thank you, Giles. OK, so let's get straight into it. I'll start off with the we've been sent some questions in advance, so um, I'll read the questions out and then we'll pose them to the panel. First question is, why are the medical fraternity not tackling the damaged brain instead of just using archaic methods? such as strapping bits of plastic to us, splinting, dishing out pills or poisoning our body with Botox. We need to be concentrating on the damaged brain. Why can't we repair minor brain issues? Very difficult question. I'll start with Giles on that one, if that's okay. Thanks, Ranj. Yeah, what a question to start off with. And I think it really speaks to that need 
um, for many stroke survivors to have a, a straightforward solution that reverses what's happened to them um, and a, a need for healing in the brain in a, in a way that's commensurate with healing in other parts of bodily tissue following injuries in other parts of the body. And that's really difficult because it's brain tissue is different and there's a lot of active research going on, but an answer has not been found um, that's easily um, translatable into everyday clinical practice around reversing brain damage. Um, what there is in um, everyday practice for those who have an ischemic stroke, that whole um, push um, to get to hospital quickly when you have a block um, uh, stroke, um, that is focusing on a certain kind of reversing of, of um, brain damage. That's uh, something called a penumbra, which is a, a shadow of brain damage around the site of the block where there's been an ischemic stroke. And um, doctors are able to reduce that shadow, minimize the actual damaged brain affected by that kind of a stroke um, within a particular time window. So that's one example. But you're right, there isn't the magic wand yet that reverses everything um, for all types of strokes um, to a complete way. And I think that's a really difficult thing, isn't it? Because um, what um, my colleagues and I have from a rehabilitation perspective is managing everyday problems on a day by day basis, often using indirect means rather than that magic wand um, that takes it all away. And that's really difficult. But what I will say, there is a lot of money. There's an um, in neuroscience research. This, a, this is a focus. Um, the answers are constantly being investigated. We just haven't quite got there yet. Thanks for that, Giles. Um, Melanie, would you like to add anything to that? I think I think really, I mean, Giles has answered the question extremely well. We're at a stage where we're still learning so much about the brain and so much about um, how we can harness some of those neuroplasticity um, elements. You know, you have to remember that um, 30 years ago, people believed that the brain was hardwired. 30 years isn't a very long time in medicine. And um, they didn't believe that the brain could change. And now we know that's not true. So what I would say, there's, there is a huge amount of money going into research and we have all the scope of that knowledge to come for the future. So there is hope. And I think that's the message that people should take away that we now know so much more than we did 30 years ago. Um, and the advances in the last 10, even six years have been incredible. So you know, don't get disheartened, but know that this work is being done. Thank you for that, Melanie. And Claire? <laughs> Managed to, yeah, yeah th uh, thank you, Melanie and Jazz. It's really, it's really interesting seeing the different perspectives and how we all answer these questions differently because we haven't discussed that before on the panel, but I think that's what's so great about different strokes is it brings together so many different people with different experiences and different viewpoints to look at these sort of complicated issues. And it's great for uh, service users of different strokes, but it's also great for us therapists that we kind of like, we are always constantly learning and getting those different ideas about how we tackle these issues because it is really tough, you know, it, it, in some ways you think, well, why can't we just go in there and repair this damage? We can do all sorts of amazing things to, you know, to bodies and science and doctors do. And it's, it's, it, it must be a great source of frustration. Um, and knowing that we're making progress is, is great and should give us all hope for the future. Um, one of the things that sort of hasn't really been mentioned well, is, and I was sort of just doing my own little bit of research, because quite interesting, you start looking into different different things when you get posed these questions and sort of the stem cell research stuff that is, is going on. And again, you start looking and it's look and it, there's excitement there that things can happen and things can change. But 
it's it's slow and progress has to be slow everything has to be obviously clinically approved and the pro process is gone through so um you know we know that stem cell research is something exciting we don't know how far it will take us individually you know in our own journeys with stroke but it's exciting to know that those kind of innovative things are out there that people are taking this seriously and looking at how we can help um, stroke survivors um, in, in many, many different ways. And there are you know, research projects going on in this country and, and overseas that we're all learning from. And I think that ties into what Melanie was saying about, you know, we know that the brain has this plasticity. It's got this amazing capacity to learn. It's what the brain wants to do. And it can, it can be frustrating at times because it feels like you know maybe things aren't changing but that constant ability to to re to regenerate and to relearn is is a great source of um hope for us in in the stroke rehab the other thing i sort of wanted to touch on was obviously we sort of mentioned about um plastic splints and things and that's something that is changing again it's it's a slow thing and, and it's it's being able to access and get available, you know, get to some of these new technological uh, breakthroughs that are coming through. And um, some of them aren't so new, but they're just not so widely available, which is frustrating. But for example, things like electrical stimulation that's used to help with walking, which is gives um, a different way of helping to manage, for example, something like a, a leg where, where your foot is, toe is catching on the floor, so using electrical stimulation. And these things are out there and they do, they do work and they are different ways in which we can see progress is being made to help to move on um, in our sort of the way that we help tackle the, the issues that stroke, that stroke survivors have. So I think the sort of in summary, it's, it is difficult. There isn't, unfortunately, a fix, but there is lots of hope and lots of um, enthusiasm, lots of research and lots of things going on um, to work towards new new ways of tackling the problem. Thank you, Claire. I think that's key as well. I think that the, just to reiterate some of the points that have been made, that there's lots of research going on at the moment. I know that our local group down here are involved with lots of research with the the um, the university um and with the hospital themselves um especially on things like thrombectomy and stuff and how the advances in that have kind of really changed things around and it's critical for time uh, uh to, to 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 see if those um uh, methodologies will kind of help people once they've had a stroke um but there's yeah there's so many advances um and it's i, I think it, it is really encouraging and something that melanie mentioned so, you know some years ago the 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 difference in rehab as well from you know five ten years ago is is amazing um and, and the claire mentioned so um we can just hope that things will continue to get better and um and that the stroke community kind of carry on with that voice as well because that's really important to be part of those conversations um i'm conscious that we'll need to move on to the to the second question um <clears throat> why isn't neuroplasticity promoted and encouraged more during rehabilitation and Claire can I start with you on that one please yes yeah this is like my pet <laughs> like subject I love it it's it's great so just sort of going back to just to clarify really what neuroplasticity is and Melanie sort of uh, touched on it earlier so uh, a sort of short quote really is it's the ability of the nervous system to change its activity in response to intrinsic so internal or extrinsic outside stimulus by reorganizing structure function and connections so it's like the brain just wants to learn and do things and it will respond to stimulus so we've just got we've got to give it the the right stimulus so in the question sort of mentioned that it wasn't encouraged early on in the rehabilitation which is sort of interesting um to hear i think um, obviously, everybody's experience is individual um, and it, it sometimes can feel that things are just being done to you as processes, I'm sure, rather than as part of a, an ongoing programme. But the, the good thing about or the, the amazing thing about neuroplasticity is it's never too late. Our bodies are plastic and able to change. So even in those early days, it may not have been, unfortunately, very well explained or described to you. The, the reasoning behind some of the procedures that were being done. 
But the great thing is it's not time dependent. We, our bodies are plastic and are able to change years after stroke. And we see that all the time that we have stroke survivors who are continually making progress and change. So the things that have happened uh, and, and that, that initial phase that maybe it wasn't just, you know, uh, felt like neuroplasticity was sent essential part of the recovery. I think now it's just coming, going forward and, and having the hope in and the optimism that neuroplasticity does does work for us. We just have to get that stimulus right. So making it meaningful and it's repetition, repetition, repetition. I mean, I could be standing for the new PM with catchphrases like that, but that's what it is. It's doing things again and again and again, and it's frustrating and it's hard. And I'm really aware of that when I'm working with stroke survivors, because, you know, we can say, oh, you've got to do so many of this, so many of that. But also, we've got to get on and live our lives and do the things that are exciting and, and fun and enjoyable that we want to do. So it's trying to find that balance. But I think to be optimistic in all the activities that you do, you are giving your brain this stimulus these and building these connections and building these pathways to forming better, better movement patterns, easier ways to, to move and do activities. Um, and my last little bit is just really things that help neuroplasticity are all the good things in life that we should be that we should be doing or we try to do with it, a good diet a good level of sleep a good level of exercise in general all of these factors help in neuroplasticity as well as the repetitions but also really important i think is making things meaningful because our bodies like to do things that are meaningful so it's finding activities and ways of doing activities with your therapist or with your different strokes group that are meaningful because that's more exciting to our nervous system than just doing 10 repetitions of something, but doing 10 repetitions of an activity that's help that you find exciting, your nervous system will find it exciting. Thank you, Claire. That's, that's a, a great answer. Um, Giles, do you want to add anything to that? <clears throat> yes, I would. Let's have a moment of neuroplasticity right now. Imagine a chihuahua surfing on a banana in a lake of tomato soup. We have just formed connections between disparate neural network and neural uh, networks in our brain. Neuroplasticity isn't something that we usher in to existence in a special way. It happens all the time. It defines our activity. So, you know, it's to echo what Claire said, it's about being active and, and, and joyful and, and making new connections and new experiences. We're doing it anyway. And rehab is an active, meaning driven process rather than laying back and waiting for the connections to happen in a passive way. So, you know, it, it's not something that's 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 it's been something that's been part of our lives already. Just continue to have those new experiences. And if the stroke means that you need to access new experiences in different ways, then you know it's that that's what you need to do. It's just the the novelty, learning, uh, newness is key to um, kind of brain health and rich brain connection. Thank you, Giles. I don't know about everyone else, but I've just got this chihuahua in my head at the moment in tomato something and with a banana. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I'm sure I'll go. Melanie. Yeah, I too have that chihuahua now. Thank you, Giles. Bit of a bit of a worry for the afternoon. Um, I uh, just wanted to talk about a bit a bit about aphasia and neuroplasticity. Um, so someone explained to me that if you can imagine better than a chihuahua, I hope, but if you can imagine you're taking your dog for a walk or taking someone else's dog for a walk, and you're crossing a field. And as you walk across that field, you start to create a path. And if you decide to walk that field every day for 300 days, you will make a path. And then you go on holiday for two weeks and the grass grows over and the path starts to not be so, so obvious. And that's really what this repetition is about. You are creating new neural pathways in the brain and you have to do things repetitively to create those pathways and then to maintain them. 
So in terms of aphasia, I, I think I have said it's been a really slow process, but the amount of funding that has gone into research in the last six years, for sure, and the Stroke Association is the biggest funder of aphasia research. So um, it's important to know that that work is being funded. Um, there, there's some really exciting things going on. So in 2019, they opened the first intensive aphasia therapy centre at UCL as an NHS therapy centre. Now, obviously, these are early days and we've had the dreaded pandemic, which has slowed everything up. But there is now this centre and there is huge work going on there, um, which wasn't available before. And we're learning all the time and we're able to chart information as we learn, as patients go through, which will improve the experience for other people. And even in May of this year, there was a huge um, comprehensive symposium about aphasia and this intensive therapy, stuff that's been going on in the States and other countries in Europe for a long time, but is new to the UK relatively. Um, also, there's this explosion of apps and software. Um, again, it started off slowly, but now since everybody has started to find ways and uh, to become more able to access um, IT and computer related apps and software, you know, they can create the right conditions for relevant and meaningful um, in aphasia, that would be meaningful words, words that you use in every day, not dolphins and giraffes and things you don't have in your house, but words that you want to use every day. Um, that intense task repetition can now be done through these aphasia apps and the software. And, and that's all of that information can be found for free using um, mystrokeguide.com and I'm sure um, we can share the links and that but you know without registration you can now get information about apps apps that have been tried and tested by people with aphasia and you can start to see what you might like to try I know that's not right for everyone and there there's nothing to say that having five or 10 words that you want to practice and learn and keep looking at and keep repeating and maybe doing that with a friend or a carer or a family member. There's nothing to say that that kind of um, activity is not as important or as useful. So don't think it has to be apps. It doesn't have to be that. There are other things that you can do. And I think the other thing really is there is research which suggests some key elements that support this brain, brain plasticity. Things like doing word games, maybe even video games for some people. Making music, so joining a choir or even um, having a, a, a play around on a musical instrument like a piano keyboard or something. Uh, travel visiting new places, learning new things, trying out new food, for example, exercise, which is important for everyone, making art, doodling can be an amazing way of opening up the brain and uh, getting more, more function or more um, creative activity going on from the right side of the brain. If you have aphasia, which is caused potentially in your left side of the brain. Um, clearly the guided repetition um, of specially designed tasks. So you need some support from a therapist or um, someone who's had experience of doing that. And uh, I mean, just to say all of that is out there and all of that is something which everyone should be doing. We should all be trying to have a part, playing a part in our own recovery. I think that's so important. I saw at Speakability, the moment that someone took ownership of their recovery, the progress increased immensely. It's really important that you don't spend time only being concerned about the lack of NHS support, 
but that you actually decide and commit to do something to help yourself. There is a health warning. Everyone's experience of aphasia is different. It's unique. And what helps one person won't necessarily help another. But it's worth trying different things and just understand that if one thing doesn't work, something else might. Thank you, Melanie. That's fa fabulous. Um, and yeah, yeah, it's. Um, I think another example of that <clears throat> is the groups that uh, Different Strokes has up and down the country where people are able to kind of go along and have a chat to other people um, and just find out how they're getting on and what they're doing in their re where they are in their rehab journey. And every now and again, someone will pick up a little nugget of information, which will make a huge difference to their rehab and their rehab journey. And the fact that another point that someone raised earlier was the fact that, you know, rehab journeys don't just end four to six weeks, six months or whatever. It, they go on and on. Rehab continues you know indefinitely and um so please don't get disheartened folks about that either moving on to the next question and i think i'll start with you melanie on this one is how can i help my husband more with his speech and language yeah it's a, it's a good question and i'm pleased it's being asked because that in itself shows that people are exercised by wanting to help people and by taking some control over this recovery. So um, I think that I'm gonna keep it short, um, but I mean, there is a blog of mine actually on the Different Strokes website at the moment. So do have a look at that. There's some, some good ideas in there. But the first thing I would say is keep communicating. Don't stop communicating just because communication is difficult or different. Um, and remember that as well as verbal communication, there's nonverbal. You can pick up a lot from people's uh, body positions, from their facial expressions, from any hand gestures and use them all. You know, total communication is what we need to be using, not just focusing on words. And the other side of that is remember that silence is golden. And People need periods of rest because that rest aids recovery too. And particularly early days after a stroke, the fatigue can be quite intense. So remember to give people breaks as well. The second thing is really positive reassurance. People with aphasia often get treated as if they're stupid or dumb or drunk or whatever. And it's really important that we treat everyone whatever their level of aphasia, as an intelligent adult, because that's what they are. And carers, keep it light. You know, if you're tired or frustrated and things aren't going well, try and give yourselves a break. Try and walk away from that. Say, so let's come back to this in a short while so that you're not unleashing your frustration into an already frustrated situation. Third thing, learn as much as you can about aphasia. In the last six years, I've seen so much more awareness of aphasia. It's not perfect. It's, it's not going to be. You can never stop telling people. But there's much more information out there. There's much more user experience information um, where people who have aphasia themselves are sharing what they've learned and what works for them. And the different strokes groups are an excellent way of finding out more about that. Um, and also the um, My Stroke Guide where you can link up with other people. And then a fourth thing is load up on your practical coping techniques. We all do it all the time, just not specific to stroke or aphasia. So, you know, things like carrying a card, which explains that you have aphasia. Um, using all the useful features on your smartphone or tablet. There's a lot of stuff on there that can help you. Take photographs of where you want to go or where you are or what you want to share with people um, and explore those apps and the software. Um, there's, there's lots out there and you just need to find more information, but it is there and it's freely available, as I said. And I think 
the fifth thing I would say is for people living with someone who has had a stroke and has aphasia, try new things together. The one thing you shouldn't do is just assume that someone with aphasia will go to their hospital appointments or their speech therapy and you don't have to do anything. It's not like that. It's a partnership. So I would say try new things together, move forwards together, take the focus and the concentration off what you can't do anymore and concentrate on what you haven't tried yet and what you might be able to do. Level the playing field and make sure you laugh together because I think that's a really important way to move forwards. So you can laugh together while you're trying new exercise. You know, what about doing some of Giles's Tai Chi? They're great, the video's great. Um, or some of the exercises that Claire's been talking about. A bit of art. You don't have to be Van Gogh to uh, sit down and have a doodle or to try and paint your dog or your cat. Uh, I know they don't stand still very long, but you know, have a go, try it out. Music, listening to music and having a tap on that keyboard if you can. Games, travel and new hobbies things that you haven't tried yet keep keep looking photography some people suddenly take up and find that they're you know really good at this and some people have turned that into a way of earning money as a profession so there's things that you can do and as I said have a look at the blog on the different strokes website and get some more ideas from there brilliant thank you Molly some really fantastic ideas actually and examples um same question to Claire, if I can come to you, Claire. Wow, how do I follow that? <laughs> that is just like such brilliant advice from the from the expert. And yeah, it's just so great here. I mean, I, I honestly don't think I can really add an awful lot to that. Um, the one thing I would say just from experience with a couple of people I've been working with recently who have taken up things uh, um, one of them's photography and the other one, uh, the other person is drawing and art. And I have to say, I just sort of champion what uh, Melanie was saying, because those taking up those new hobbies and having a new and different focus has, they have expressed to me um, how much of a change that has made to their general well-being, but also in their communication and in their speech. And I've noticed it sometimes we, you know, we see clients for, we may, may review them every few months and you notice big changes then. And I, I'm always a great you know, champion of saying, well, yes, I can see the difference and being and, and feeding that back. So, um, yeah, I think all, all that advice is, is really valuable for, for all of us professionals and um, those of us sort of living with stroke. So thank you. Thank you, Claire. Um, Giles, do you have anything to add to that? <clears throat> I would just add. Um, from a perspective of being a couples therapist and working with couples where one partner has aphasia because this is a wife asking about her husband and you know language and communication between romantic couples is unique isn't it it's often less is more as may said it, it's the non-verbals it's the physical touch the look to the eyes and maybe you know words expressing powerful emotional connection like I love you and it, it's I know that you know my couples work with aphasia often when the non-injured partner is speeding up and saying too much then it can disconnect and be a wedge in between the couple so uh, going for saying the most important things to each other and supporting that two-way communication um, to enhance that emotional connection as a couple is really important. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much, Charles. Um, I'm going to move on to our next question. Um, why is it spasticity and cramping happens months after stroke, Claire? Thank you. Yeah, this is this is a really interesting question because um, it'd be it'd been interesting to sort of delve a bit deeper into it. So it might be I'm not sure if the questions come from a perspective that they hadn't experienced it and then they and then this this individual suddenly is. So I sort of thought let's just have a, an overview of, of what these different things are because this is all normal. That's what my, the main thing I would say is it's all normal. It's part of um, part of stroke, part of having had a neurological injury, and um, 
so it's not to be worried about but of course it does interfere with the flow of of, of life so we want to do our best to try and tackle it and then as if by magic in this month's uh or this this autumn newsletter there's a whole feature on um could I have post-stroke spasticity, which I think is really a really nice, valuable resource to, to go and look at. So there's a couple of bits I've picked from there, but I'm sure you've all got the, the uh, newsletter, so you can have a, a read of that. So cramping and spasticity and, and muscle time, muscle turn, all these sort of phrases that we get sort of thrown about and, and sometimes sort of used interchangeably and there are technically sort of differences between different things. Um, but I think when somebody sort of says that, we all generally know what, what, they're, what they're feeling. So sort of cramping can sometimes just happen for no reason in, in all of the population. Um, or sometimes it's as a, as a secondary result of, um, of an event. Oh, so I just saw a question pop up. They, the newsletter, someone's answered it, about the Different Strokes newsletter. Um, anyway, so cramping is really happens because we've got a disruption to the nerve activity um, and a change to the, the blood flow. So it can be as a result of, of um, more exercise and the legs tired. And then sometimes people observe they get these nighttime cramps. Um, and then other factors that can influence it are things like dehydration, poor nutrition, medications, and unfortunately, things like statins and drugs that reduce blood pressure are all sort of known to have cramping as a side effect. And often, of course, um, that's that they're commonly prescribed drugs in our population. Um, so they're all things that that um, influence us getting cramps. And then the other word that was used was spasticity so um Ruffin here is sort of talking about post-stroke spasticity and of course we've got this this nice article to refer to but spasticity is slightly different from cramping so cramping tends to be an event it's sort of a sudden tightening of the muscles and then they relax off and I think we probably all experience that at some point you know lying in bed you suddenly get a cramp in a muscle or you crouch down you get a cramping and it, it eases and it passes. Whereas with spasticity and high muscle tone, it's something that's more there all the time, but things will peak and, and trough. So um, in terms of what we, we think of as muscle uh, spasticity, um, quoting from the newsletter is a nice, uh, nice quote. It's sort of a stiff, heavy and abnormally tight feeling in the muscle. And it makes movement more difficult. Um, and when you stretch the muscle, there's more resistance. So it's this sort of uh, feeling of tightness, heaviness and resistance in trying to move, which, of course, makes movements more difficult. And then when we add in fatigue, that makes it more difficult still. Um, and we have spasticity occurs because of nerve damage. So because of the stroke, we've got damage to the way that our um, nerves, uh, uh, muscles receive information from our nervous system um, and it's hard for them to control the level of input and output and regulate things so we get this sort of build up of of tightness and stiffness in our muscles and it can be that things trigger it and make it worse so we know that sort of fatigue makes makes it worse so when a when a muscle gets very fatigued and that can happen quite quickly post-stroke then then um then spasticity increases. It can also be very much related to emotional stress. Um, and that can also be if someone's yeah. frustration, if, if they're trying to express something and it's difficult because of aphasia, then that can increase sort of tightness and spasticity. And we'll see that in our clients. And then things like laugh, which is not fair at all, but things like laughing and joking and that we see that increases tightness as well. But I'm not saying don't laugh or joke. It just, we notice it and then it, it does reduce a little bit. So the question coming from uh, to the panel was about experience it six months afterwards. So um, if it's if it's a new onset and not been had before, then it might be something that you you'd like to speak to your GP about because it might be indicative of of um, other areas that you might want to look at. You know, are there any any other things going on if you've got some pain or their issue, medical issues but it is a very normal part of stroke recovery and in terms of what can we do about it 
it's it's the using of your muscles in an appropriate way, stretching, yoga, exercises, and also keeping well hydrated, good nutrition, and all those things will help. But for some uh, people, really specific exercises are the thing. And that would be a good thing to sort of have prescribed to you by a physiotherapist local to you or somebody at different strokes to really work on stretching those specific muscles um, that are cramping or, or going into sort of spasticity. Thank you, Claire. Thank you for that. Um, Giles, is there anything you'd like to add to that? And this is outside my area of expertise, so I'll leave that to Claire. Okay. And Melody, same? Yeah, also. Thank you, Claire, for that. Um, Final question that we've been sent in advance. Um, how do we navigate the separate health professionals who do not talk to each other to get the best from the NHS? I have issues related to my stroke, plus diabetes, menopause, etc. It's a minefield. Um, I think I'll start with that one. Um, as a stroke survivor myself, I kind of used my professional skills to to coordinate all of the different people and the professionals who I needed or I felt I needed to to kind of get my rehab journey back on track so I uh, contacted a neurophysio a, a neurophysio um I worked with my GP um and um between them and a, and a health and fitness person I kind of put together a plan for myself um, and was able to kind of hit the goals that I think thought I needed. Um, but then one of the key things that I, that kind of crossed my mind was that not everyone's kind of got that skill set, or not, not everyone's able to do that. So it really shouldn't be the stroke survivor who's in the middle of it all coordinating these different kind of bits of information and um, these different goals and stuff. Um, so I'm just wondering what the panel kind of feel about that. Um, and Giles, can I start with you on that one? Thank you. Um, yeah, I think it's it's one of these unnecessary additional challenges for the life path and the journey, life journey path of stroke survivors after the actual stroke. I've always worked in community rehabilitation, and we've I know that I and my colleagues do see it as our role to walk alongside and be the glue and adhesion and connect other professions. And I contrast that with my colleagues, say my psychology colleagues in acute hospital environments. And it's like the hospital um, frames their thinking at times. They don't think beyond the hospital walls, um, even to maybe access colleagues in a different ward in the hospital. And there's something about the kind of the more acute, the more hospital based, the less likely you're going to get someone to reach out to their mini world to connect with someone else. At the same time, most people want to be helpful. So if there's a very specific connection that you need from, from one clinician to another, I wouldn't imagine anyone would say no to that. They just might not be thinking to do that. But beyond that, I think having a someone in a navigator kind of role, sometimes there's a formal navigator that can navigate and walk alongside you. Sometimes it's it's finding someone who, who you get on well with and you've experienced to be flexible and creative and organized, communicates well with you. And you can ask them if they can help be the glue for you and the other pieces of the jigsaw um, in your life and connect to other people. Um, I think it's often when it doesn't happen, it's just because people don't think to do it rather than people actively refusing to. But if you know someone is a good glue adhesive, bringing in all the other people together, then do use them. They they may be from a health background, but they, they may most likely not be. They might be from a kind of third sector or um, community or social kind of background where that kind of um, networking connection is, is more bread and butter. Than from a like a health, a particularly acute health background. Thank you, Giles. Thanks for that. Um, Claire. Yeah, this is a really interesting question, and I suppose it, it goes across all health 
issues, doesn't it? That it sometimes feels like it's lots of stoppy starty things and we want some joined up thinking and it's it's very difficult um so with the clinic that we work in people come to us often with without a, a referral they self-refer themselves into the clinic and i um i love it when they turn up with a few bits of paper in a folder because i kind of know they've got the information there and it's sort of they've come prepared and they've got a list of their medications so we're not trying to work out you know and i can take a copy of that and keep it in our file on their file and those sorts of things are, are really useful so it's very difficult because when you've been thrown into a situation you didn't want to be thrown into with the you know challenges for your physical your mental health your speech and language all those things and then suddenly you've got to become this expert organizer admin type person and we all have too much admin to do anyway without you know throwing all this at us well it's it's really tough so i think as giles was saying it's, it's maybe trying to find somebody to help you down that that path and it might not be a it might not be a necessarily a healthcare professional. It might be someone and a, a friend who desperately wants to help, doesn't know what they can do. You know, are they the are they the person to help you just map it out and the, the, the think out what do I need to do to to I suppose best prepare myself for this system that we know is isn't ideal and um, you know the NHS is is not able to offer us everything we would like in every form we would like and unfortunately we we know that is the case um and it's very 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 difficult and challenging and and but trying to think well this is the system that we're going to have to try and navigate and how i can best present myself and be prepared with the things i have so it does unfortunately throw the onus back on on the service user but it's then can we can I then access things most effectively? And of course, I mean, different strokes are just such a great resource and source of people and information. I mean, when I go to our local group, which unfortunately isn't as often as I'd like to recently, but people have a wealth of information and that's so useful. And often in our clinic, will somebody will ask me something, I'll think, I don't know, but I know so-and-so and I think they might know, so we can find out and you know, get you two together because you can, you've got the shared experience and you can help each other. And there's nothing that people like more than helping each other and passing on useful information. So um, it's a really, a really tr tricky one. But I think as Giles said, I don't think it's that people don't want necessarily to be obstructive in their communication. It's just in, in the system, it feels like it's, you're fighting against it, which is, is incredibly frustrating. Yeah, no, I certainly agree. Thank you, Claire. And Melanie? Yeah, good good advice from Claire, who I believe is now standing for Prime Minister <laughs> as we speak. I'm looking forward to the hustings. Um, so, yeah, the system isn't working always as well as we would like it to. And inevitably, there are huge frustrations and I, I was reflecting on sort of my own experience and, and things that people have told me. But when I go to see a medical professional, it's not, it's not an easy situation. And I know that I'm not going to remember everything I want to tell them. And I know that I'll get bounced by their question and I won't um, necessarily get across the messages that I want to. And so I do think there's an element of preparation which will help you to make the most of the time with the different health professionals that you are able to secure a meeting or an appointment with. So the first thing is to collect information together. And I have a box at home. It's a cardboard box. And whenever I get any letters from the hospital or anything that's related to medical stuff or when I've found that I'm struggling with an issue and I've made a note of it I put it all in one place and then I know I've got it all together and I haven't got to go and search for things so I do encourage you to have a place where you put information that's relative to your stroke experience and your health appointments and the people you're connecting with in the community and the second thing is when you're going to an appointment, 
um, make sure that you've done your prep. And that could be just writing down the three things, the three messages you want to get across to that health professional. If you're someone who is, say, say you are female and you are of a certain age, you are going to be struggling perhaps with menopause. And we know that that can sidetrack things and, and not every GP we see is particularly interested in talking about it or helping. But if you are experiencing the menopause and the issues surrounding it, try and write down what is happening to you and what extra, in addition to everything you're coping with, with your stroke, what extra is actually happening and try and get that down on a piece of paper. And it may be that someone is helping you, an advocate. I do think that's a great idea. Um, and it could be that you have it on your phone, just as a picture on your phone. And then when you go into that appointment, which we all know are short and not quite everything we expect, you can show that or give that information to the health professional. So you have at least got your message across that there's something else going on that you need support with. And I think in terms of understanding what's going on, this is where that little bit of art that we were talking about earlier might come in. So draw yourself, could be stick figure, who knows? And just write down some of the things or draw some of the things that you're experiencing. And then you've got that picture. And if necessary, you can use that picture to have the conversation. But I think it's, it's just important to not leave it to what might happen and to take a little bit of time to prepare yourself for what you want to happen. And I know it's not the answer that will help everyone, but I do hope for some people that it might make a difference. It's a challenge for sure. Definitely. Thank you very much for that, Melanie. Thank you. Now we have had some questions come in um, whilst we've been discussing the these uh, questions I've been mean, sent in advance. So um, I'm going to start with this one um, is very high tone permanent. I've tried Botox, but my hand reverted back to its original tight and stiff form. Is there anything else I can do to utilize my very tight affected hand or will it always be like this? And Claire, I think Claire. Yes, yeah, so it's interesting to see that they've had uh, some treatment with Botox and I think this has been one of the challenges I've certainly noticed because we'll have uh, patients come to the clinic and they've had Botox, but it maybe has been a, a one-off. And really it's something that in my experience generally looks well over a course of treatments with splinting in between because the Botox sort of gives a window of opportunity. It relaxes off some of those, that tightness in the muscles and gives us an opportunity to get more into, let's say in this case, into that hand. So. Um, they mentioned that they've tried it, but it reverted back again. So it's whether um, it's not to say that it couldn't be effective again. Um, and maybe it was there's, you know, different muscles will be injected. So it's still worth going back. If it had good effect at that time, there's no reason to think it couldn't have good effect again. But I think the key thing is, is that it's then followed up in the best and the most appropriate way. Be that with some probably a combination of things of exercises, stretches, things that can you can be shown to do, you know, yourself at home or with support at home. Um, and and trying to it's very it's very hard when the hand becomes tight and stiff. It kind of becomes something that you just become frustrated and annoyed with and want to just push aside but I think it's trying to learn to love and nurture and in, and integrate this your hand in into as many day-to-day -day activities as you can um, but I, I certainly think if the Botox has worked once then there is no no sound reason why it wouldn't again the reversion back is just part of the normal way in which the therapy works so it's it's then following it up more appropriately okay thank you for that claire thank you i'm i'm conscious of time so and we've got a few other questions to get to so i'll i'll move on if that's okay guys um 
what sort of assessments should people expect early after stroke? Many problems are not apparent until people are home again, after which it can be a problem to find help. And um, I think Claire again on that one, sorry. Oh. Sorry, I forgot that bit. Um, that Austin also would like to, to come in on this one. Um, yes, I think this is a common problem because there's a big drive, isn't there, to get home. We all want to be home in our environment. And then and then there's been some level of assessment to check that things are safe, say from a physical point of view, getting to bathroom, kitchen. Um, but yeah, this is this is a tricky one because ideally, and I know luckily in, in the area I live in, um, there is community-based um, input that goes in. Um, so again, it's looking at having that connection, keeping that connection with the community stroke services um, and local different strokes group. So the sort of assessments you might expect early after stroke would be looking along the practical lines of, um, you know, are you able to do self-care or self-care with assistance um, and, and um, get in and out of your house? Those sorts of things, which I would imagine would have been done before uh, discharge home and also any relevant sort of speech and language assessments as well. Um, but it is a challenge when you get home because often then we slightly in a good way change the goalposts and like right I've got home I, what all I wanted to do was get home and then when you've got home we then think well actually no that's not enough anymore I want this and that I think that's brilliant because that's how we make progress but that can be frustrating in terms of how you access those services um, I would like to think there is still a connection out there with the community services from say physiotherapy occupational therapy um, but again we do know that varies from area to area I don't know if Austin wants to come in on that one. I think Austin just marked the question as as us answering it live. I think if that's oh, what. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. Yep. Uh, Austin, yeah. do you want to comment on that? <laughs> yeah, I just want to mention the, the role of cognitive assessments, um, and that's something that I think historically is offered uh, less than it should do at different um, points in the trajectory following stroke compared to other forms of brain injuries and often if cognitive assessments are done earlier on that they're, they're normally a brief screen and for example when I've done cognitive assessments of stroke survivors maybe five years post-stroke um, with, with a more uh, um, systematic assessment we found aspects of cognitive difficulties that hadn't been picked up before uh, and we might have done those assessments because someone wants to get back to a work role or something like that. So I think it's one thing that in, unfortunately, as a trend in stroke, um, cognitive assessments aren't offered enough to give kind of like a, a, an MOT of different aspects of thinking and attention and memory. So that's something that should, should be looked for where possible alongside physiotherapy, speech and language, um, and OT functional assessments. Thank you, Charles. Melanie, do you have anything to add to those two points? No, I think I think the question's been answered well, but yeah. I think also just to remember that people change, people are recovering. And so it's not unusual for someone to need or require another assessment a bit further on down their journey. And, and I know that happens particularly in cognitive assessment and in speech and language therapy assessments. So um we always used to say, do ask your GP to be referred to a specialist. And I do know that that can be a bit of a postcode lottery and it isn't an easy thing always to do. If you're really desperate, there are some um, individuals in independent practice, but it's pricey and you have to know what you're seeking and what you're hoping to get. And you need to find someone who actually has proper experience of working with people who've had strokes so it's not just any speech therapist or any occupational therapist or any um, mental health specialist it needs to be someone who has relevant uh, experience of working with people with strokes and of all ages um, but um, you know there is that independent option you just need to know exactly what you're looking for so you don't waste your money 
Thank you, Melanie. Um, another question that's coming online. How do we think we can improve post-stroke care to match the improved acute care? Four to six weeks rehab shouldn't be where your support in the community stops. Giles? Yeah, this is totally one of my soapboxes. I think it's it's I, I, I it's it's a medical dominance in stroke care culture that's led to this very short-sighted um, conclusion to care. And obviously, there's a need to get back home and everything. But I, I've always worked with stroke and other forms of brain injury, like traumatic brain injury. And, and the, the difference between the two is, is always fascinating to me, that the, there's an expectation of a longer journey uh, when, if after someone's had a traumatic brain injury in terms of involvement than stroke. And many of the difficulties, it's all to be mentioned, but many of the kind of psychological difficulties, the social difficulties, the relationship strains, they only kind of show themselves um, often uh, years one to five post-injury. And, and, and most things have, most of the health-based input has concluded. Unfortunately, that's only gone more that direction across the board because of um, you know, um, the limitations in a NHS funding. So I think this is where we need to join the whole jigsaw with health and social services and third sector. Because I think that, you know, in terms of people signing up for the long haul, the long journey, third sector, that's not a challenging thing to say. Whereas in health people, it's still quite a um, a revolutionary thing to say that actually stroke recovery and life after stroke is a long journey and people need to be available at all points. So I think um, it, it's not down to one sector and it can't be, unfortunately. It's about all of these different sectors working collaboration. No, and I couldn't agree more. And it's absolutely a, a marathon, not a sprint. And rehab continues. Well, I think lots of people say rehab, the real rehab starts when you actually get home and you start to kind of figure out how things really are and how how your life has changed rather than the medical rehab, which happens kind of early on. Um, so so thank you for that. Um, Melanie and Claire, anything to add to that? Or shall I move on? To, Melanie does. Well, just to say that this is where organisations like Different Strokes can have an impact. Um, you're not an individual just fighting the system. You have a whole organisation of people who have experienced strokes who are campaigning all the time to make that difference. And if you add to that all the other voluntary sector and other lobbies, uh, there is quite a voice. So make the most of it. You know, when it's Stroke Awareness Day and that sort of thing, uh, play your part in helping to raise that awareness of the needs. Thank you, Melanie. Um, a couple of minutes, few minutes, minutes more. So I'm going to move on to one of these other questions. Uh, what is the chance of you having another? Oh, this is a million dollar question. What is the chance of you having another major stroke when you've already had one? And what things should you avoid to prevent another major stroke from happening? Um, Claire? Yeah, this is a, I mean, to be honest, I have a, I don't know the answer. I don't know the facts and figures. From my experience, what we do see is that we don't have the greater proportion of people that I see do not go on to have another stroke. Um, but it's, again, it's, it's a very difficult question that, and nobody's going to put a figure on it or an exact answer on it, I, I don't think. I suppose it's, it's all about all those um if there if there are factors that were risk factors, have they been addressed? Do you feel your medications have been addressed correctly? Is your lifestyle changes um, are they something that you need support with? And if so, can can that support be gained so that you can get the right information, um, whether that be sort of diet, and nutrition, uh, lifestyle, exercise, and working to try and bring all those factors together to minimize ongoing risks. Um, but the only thing I, I can really say is that the greater proportion of those that I see are people that have had a single event, but unfortunately I can't really put a figure on, on it. Yep, no, totally. <laughs> Giles and Melanie, anything to add to that? Melanie? Um, oh, sorry. Just, just to say that, um, to second that, that 
if there's been an underlying risk factor, then often the first stroke happens out of the blue without anyone um, expecting it and the medical community expecting it. So by its nature, it's a call to arms, isn't it, for um, the right specialist to be monitoring it with you. And then presumably then people are under a system of monitoring and those risks are actually managed. So immediately that changes the odds. But obviously it depends on the type of stroke and the, the processes underlying. But I think a lot of people do take comfort you know, th th there's that emotional level of, um, you know, people walk around, people are at work going back to work, thinking that it's nothing's going to happen to them. And as a stroke survivor, you all know that your world can be turned upside down like that. And you've lived that where many people have not had to encounter that existential kind of uncertainty. So it's going to be hard, really hard to think that I'm going to be, I'm going to be, okay, I'm going to be all right in the future. That that's a really difficult place. Um, to, to get back to but people do take comfort that actually the people who need to be monitoring this with me are now on board thank you Giles um, another question that came in is quite specific is there any experience of stroke and Parkinson's my father was diagnosed with Parkinson's about five years ago he had a stroke in January 22 any advice on how to support my father with two things going on anyone yeah i'll um jump in we in in uh, in my in the practice i work and we see lots of people who have um other conditions that have then had a stroke or or have had a stroke and then being diagnosed with other conditions and although each sort of neurological condition the parkinson's and the stroke are are obviously very much different a lot of the principles of what we're trying to encourage people to do will be the same in terms of recovery of movement and neuroplasticity um, and teaching people uh you know show it or showing and adapting ways of movement moving or progressing on and learning new ways of moving so i think that i would i would be optimistic that they you know we can work together with those and rather than treating them as two separate things really focus on the person the challenges that the, the person and an individual is facing um and work through those rather than seeing it as stroke and parkinson's let's see it as, as a person and work with that person on the challenges they face and address those rather than the conditions okay thank you and just following on from that so there's another question that, um i think it's, i'm gonna have to make it the last question because we're really over, we're overrunning at the moment. But what can be done to fix foot drop that will actually fix the foot without having to wear a, a foot support, Claire? Ah, oh, brilliant, lovely. This, yes, loads. So um, this is when I was talking earlier about electrical stimulation. Um, so this is a, a way of activating the muscles that help lift the foot by using um, small sort of sticky pads with an electrical current running through them to help activate the muscle around the top of the, the shin area um, to help lift the foot. So this uh, type of um, device is called FES or functional electrical stimulation. Um, and it is available through the NHS and it is sort of part of um, nice guidelines that be available. It, there is a little bit of postcode lottery, but it's something you can discuss with your local physiotherapist and your GP because there are NHS clinics that operate. Um, there is, of course, if you want to go into the private sector, there's that option too, but there's very much is that service available. Um, and we have lots of clients that come to us to seek physiotherapy that have uh, FES foot drop provided from them within the NHS service. Um, and the beauty of it is, is that it means you don't have to wear um, a plastic or carbon fiber support in the shoe. Um, and some devices, you don't have to have your shoes on. They can be, uh, they're set up and they don't need a foot switch. They use a motion sensor. So there's lots of options out there. It's the it's the, the challenges being able to access them. But I suggest you, you go and speak with your GP and ask them about it. And again, as we mentioned, and Melanie mentioned earlier, do a little bit of research. So if you look up um, about um, FES, functional electrical stimulation for foot drop and go to the GP with that. That will really stand you in good stead. You've done your research. You know what you want. 
then you're asking, can this be provided? And then the question can go from there. Brilliant. Thank you, Claire. Thank you for that. Um, based on the time, I think um, we're going to kind of um, hold the questions there. If there are any other further questions that anyone does have, um, and you weren't able to get answers to, or you, or you want to send them in, please email them to us at info at differentstrokes.co.uk and we'll do our best to, to, to answer them. Um, I just want to thank the wonderful panel in front of me today. Um, you guys come in year in, year out. Um, hopefully next year we'll be able to do something maybe a bit more face-to-face, -face, we'll, we'll, we'll work that out. But thank you again, guys, and very much appreciate everything that you've done today. Um, so that concludes basically the the different strokes conference 2022 um and what a conference we've had i'm sure you'll agree it's been a fantastic event um but great events are only great when you get loads of engagement um so the types of questions and the comments that we've had over the various sessions each day this week have been fabulous but they've been really really great um so it's just wonderful to see the, the the stroke community coming together like that. Um, I'd also like to thank all the attendees because, like I said, you guys kind of really make the event worthwhile for us um, from Chicago to the UK and everywhere in between. So thank you very much for taking, taking the time and attending uh, our conference this year. Thank you to Bolt, Burden and Kemp, um, Bolt, Burden, Kemp, sorry, for sponsoring our event this year. Um, and thank you again to all of our fabulous guest speakers who've given up their time um, and volunteered this volunteered their time throughout this week to share their knowledge and experiences and be so engaging and inspiring and encouraging to everyone. So um, I've been reading a lot of the, the chat comments in the week, and it, it really is so heartwarming to know that people have gained so much from our conference. Um, a very, very special thanks to Austin Willett, our CEO, and the wonderful Different Strokes team, who I'm slightly biased about, I know, but anyway, they are fabulous. They've put on a great event, and they always do. Um, they're just superb. Um, and again, thank you, guys. You've done fabulously well. Um, as with all these sessions, they've all been recorded, so and they will be available to everyone um and uh, they'll be posted up on the website or on youtube but there'll be links um and one final thank you to just everyone involved um for being part of this and for being part of our different strokes community so thank you